not, uh, not going to use a microphone. I hope you can hear me. Um, Michael speaks. I'm dean of the School of Architecture. I'm really, really pleased to uh, to announce the lecture and to, to make an introduction briefly tonight. Uh, but I, I also want to 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 make everybody aware that this this is a named lecture tonight. This is the Werner Seligman lecture. Um, many of you. Students uh, will know uh, the name of Werner Seligman. He was dean here um, from 1976 to 1990. Um, uh, he was educated at Cornell uh, and in Germany. He taught at uh, UT Austin, Cornell, and GSD before joining the faculty at Syracuse. It's, I, I think it wouldn't be a stretch to say that uh, that the school is famous today, largely in part. Uh, to the legacy that Werner Seligman created and, and has passed on to all of us. Um, I, I want to say, uh, after his death in uh, 1998, uh, the Werner Seligman Lecture Endowment uh, was created to sponsor an annual lecture series or symposium at the school. Um, previous Seligman lectures have included Peter Eisenman, Craig Dykers from uh, Snowetta, Greg Pascarelli, uh, Enrique Norton, Walter Hood, Scott Erdy, and many others. Um, I would say that we also uh, are very lucky to have in the audience tonight Gene, Sal Gene Seligman um, and, uh, and other uh, colleagues. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to uh, take too long to, to make this introduction. As you can see, I, I, I know the speaker very well. Uh, I've known him for maybe more than 20 years. Um, but when someone has produced so much and done so much, you start to look back, uh, even though you know them well, to try to put together an introduction. And I, I gave up uh, in printing off Ben's projects after about 15 pages. There are quite a lot of them. Um, so I'm going to make a very brief uh, introduction. Um, many of you know uh, Benjamin Burkle uh, and his work already. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll give a little context and, 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 and try to make a slightly formal introduction. Um, I think the, the format will be, uh, Ben's going to talk for maybe uh, 50 minutes or so, but he would uh, very much like to have questions uh, after the lecture, so he'd be happy to have a, you know, a dialogue um, to respond to the lecture. Um, ben uh, was educated at the Rietveld Academy uh, in Amsterdam, uh, graduate of the AA in London. Uh, in 1988, uh, formed um, Ben, ben Burkel and Boss, uh, and in 1998 uh, the, the office was uh, renamed um, UN Studio. Um, many, 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 many famous projects. Um, um, I'm going to cite a few of them here, but I'm also just going to read a little bit, uh, else I, I forget everything. Um, Yeah, uh, talk a little bit of just briefly about some of the uh, uh, Ewan Studio and Van Berkel and Boss. I think are, are famous as architects, but they also have produced a number of remarkable books, uh, beginning with uh, Delinquent Visionaries in 1993, uh, 1994 Mobile Forces, uh, Move, uh, a very very famous book that I think was um, that coincided uh, with the emergence of Ewan with with Ewan Studio proper. Uh, UN Studio Fold. Um, one of my actual, one of my favorite books, but also uh, a book that contains, I think, still one of the most remarkable essays written by an architect or a critic or theorist in contemporary architecture came uh, from a book published uh, in 2006 called Design Models. Um, I don't know how many of you know the book or know the essay. I suspect everybody does. There are two remarkable essays. One is uh, at the end of the book called After Images. The essay in the beginning of the book is called Design Models. And I, I still think we have not fully understood the implications of that. And I think some of the things that Ben will talk about tonight will be uh, an extension, I think, of some of the concepts that were developed in that book and that come out of Design Models. Um, you know, ben is working in the, in, in the studio is, is uh, these days um, uh, developing um, something they call knowledge platforms, and I think it extends really out of this, uh, this understanding of design models. And, and design models were really, I think, a way for UN Studio to look back 
um, to, uh, to kind of make an analysis of all their projects, to see in those projects uh, a series of patterns which they call design models. And those models, uh, beginning in 2006, uh, although they had been doing this, I think, for some time, became really a, a means of designing, but also a means of storing and repurposing knowledge that came from the projects. I think the most significant thing about design models um, is that uh, they were not uh, an importation of external knowledge or ideas or philosophical text or slime molds uh, as uh, became famous, uh, you know, Peter Eisenman uh, in, the, in the 90s. It, this was not an importation of external discourse, but design models of the production of knowledge by an office to be repurposed and to, to be used by the office. It's a, it's a pretty it's a pretty exciting and, and still, I think, not fully understood um, uh, idea or, 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 or concept. Um, and I think Ben is going to probably expand on that a little bit tonight. Um, many, many, many famous projects. Uh, I hope some of you have seen the Mercedes-Benz uh, Muse uh, Mercedes Museum in Stuttgart. Um, there's the famous Mobius House in Holland. Um, there is... Uh, my favorite, the Erasmus Bridge. Um, Ben's done work up in you know, uh, upstate New York. Um, they've built uh, many, many, many projects in the last year alone uh, completed uh, in, in Asia, projects in Singapore, uh, projects in Taiwan, projects in, in Korea. Uh, I'm on their email list, and if you are on that list, you get a new email almost every week with a project being completed. It's kind of shocking. Um, um, so, uh, so uh, lots and lots and lots of projects. But, uh, but I have two. Uh, I, I knew Ben's work very, very early on. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Holland in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, got to know the scene very well. And the scene was very complicated and lots of players. Um, but uh, I was a researcher at the Technological University of Delft in uh, 1994, I think it was. Um, and I had an office at the top of the Baukunde, at the top of the School of Architecture. It was on the 12th floor. And from there in Holland, you can, from 12 floors up, you can see Belgium. You can see everything. Uh, and I, one of the most remarkable things I've really ever seen in my life uh, was uh, one day I was working at my desk, and I looked on the horizon, and I saw what I couldn't believe, what I thought I saw, which was a huge bridge moving across the Dutch landscape. Um, and in fact, it was a bridge. Uh, it was the Erasmus Bridge, one of the most famous uh, early projects of UN Studios. What they had done is they, they, the bridge was literally on a barge being floated uh, along a canal uh, on its way to Rotterdam Harbor, where it would eventually be assembled. Um, I have photographs of that, that that are still some of the most amazing uh, that, I, that I've taken. So, um, love to think about that, love to think about those times, a uh, lot of exciting projects. It's been uh, a while uh, since I've seen Ben lecture, I've seen him online, but, uh, but I'm thrilled, thrilled, thrilled that he's here tonight. And I um, want to thank uh, you all for being here and help me, I want to ask you all to help me welcome a uh, friend, colleague, and in my view, one of the most important architects certainly in the world, uh, Ben Van Berkel. Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to talk uh, with the microphone, otherwise in these 50, uh, 55 minutes I, I have to uh, 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 give, give my full heart to you, uh, uh, otherwise I will be uh, quite tired. So. So if you don't hear me in the back, then you have to raise your uh, hand. Uh, what I will do uh, this afternoon is that I, I will not go from, you know, from, from, like Michael said, I will not go from project to project and explain why and how we did the projects. But I'd like to talk more about the ideas of, of how the projects came together. Maybe also about the way how we sometimes reflect the ideas back to ourselves or the role of the architect or the, the way how today the practice is changing. That has been fascinating me always so much because think about it. If, if you know sometimes whenever you do a project 
how the project comes together and you, and you love design, then the most important is that, that you also design your own practice and that you keep on thinking about how you can improve the practice because uh, if, you, if, you, if you know how that practice can operate in an, in an efficient and sufficient manner, then often you have much more time for design. And, and that, that is, took me a long time actually to get it as where I'm right now with the practice. But, but um, with the development of the practice, I've uh, learned that over the years that I can also make a lot of time for design. Maybe I fly around a lot and I have a lot of work over different locations. But in the same time, when I'm in the studio, I can spend at least uh, 60 up to 70% of my time on the work itself, luckily not. But, but you see here the, 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 the three letters of UN Studio, uh, maybe a bit uh, twisted and turned upside down because I, I'd like to rethink always, always what we do and how we reformulate the, uh, in the way how we do the work. And, and for that reason, I, I will for that also show some more diagrams tonight. I will not only show the work and talk about uh, uh, the ideas in the work and the way how the like maybe Michael also said, how they move from, how the ideas move from one project to the next. Uh, what, what, what for me is important always to think about the way how all the years as, as a, a practice, but also as, um, as maybe we have to also, with the practice also, uh, think about the, um, uh, uh, the profession. Uh, it is for me always so important to see how we collaborate how in the beginning of, of uh, let's say, the way how we uh, work with new techniques, like, like there was a period where we talked so much about the phenomenon of the diagram. <coughs> it was already mentioned, the de design model came later into the process of design, where the, whereby the collaborative in the network of the UN network organization of UN Studio, it was always important for us to invite many specialists. Mm. That could be fashion designers, that could be a, a scientists, that could be artists, People who join the studio and, and, and in the workshop work with us together on the ideas of, of the projects we will work on. And design models were, in principle, I will, I will explain it later, they, they were for us pro prototypes of the way how through, an, you could call it a large detail or an, a mathematical model, for instance, how they could be turned into an uh, organizational strategy for the building. But, but if I think about it, of how we uh, work today, uh, we slowly move, I noticed, more from the network practice to its a, a more knowledge-based uh, practice, as we uh, 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 call it uh, uh, lately, whereby even the principle of co-creative uh, ideas come far more easy into the process of design than, let's say, only the, the creativity of what we find of the people we invite physically in the studio, uh, uh, we have learned that also online even today uh, that, that this kind of in inventiveness comes more closer into the practice uh, more than ever. So that doesn't mean that we all design and that I design with the online uh, uh, strategy the work, uh, but I collect knowledge, I, I exchange knowledge, I, I'm interested in the dialogue, I'm in interested in the way how today <coughs> one can start to exchange the act is in the network. And, and that for me, and maybe we know this from the theory of Latour, if you, if you know well where the actors are in the network, then you know also how to activate the network. And that's where I'm interested in when it comes down to, to uh, gather that knowledge in the network. And it doesn't mean that we are not organized anymore as a network, uh, because we are all in a network, as we know. We are in many social networks today. But, but I'd like to move away slowly from that idea, from the network, as I said, to it's a more kind of, let's call it the mesh work, whereby, whereby knowledge is overlapping each other much more than ever before. And what you see here is a diagram of, of the recent development of the way how we work. Like, like we have these knowledge platforms in the uh, organization of UN Studio, whereby um, a sustainable uh, combining group uh, combines, uh, for instance, the smart, uh, what we call the smart uh, parametric group, um, whereby we constantly uh, 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 re-innovate the, the latest techniques of the way how we design and overlap these techniques 
And you probably know that, that today you, you can with uh, uh, carry technologies, I'll give you one example, you can, for instance, uh, combine all the different computational strategies in design into one platform and if there is, if like for instance, if a contractor is working mm -hmm. one one uh, uh, computer model and you are working another computer model, you can overlap these uh, uh, different models and you can see where the differences are and co connect uh, 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 all the parties to these differences. Um, but anyway, so, so that's to do with the, uh, the, the, the knowledge platform related to new uh, computational techniques. We're also in, in a platform whereby we constantly uh, innovate the organizational structure of the way how programs can influence each other on the way how they come together in, an, uh, in a project. Uh, we call it the innovative uh, program uh, platform. But, but anyway, this idea of the overlapping platforms are brought into the process for a reason but is connected to the idea that the architect, in my opinion, is not anymore purely the architect alone when they enter, for instance, or practice. Um, when you enter the practice, you are you're slowly become a specialist within one of these platforms. Or you will be educated as one of the specialists in the platform. You might come into the uh, um, innovative material platform, for instance, but if you if you are not happy for a year or after half a year to be operating in a platform and you think you might like to move towards the sustainability platform, we, we, we guide you around that process and, and we learn then the architects to become slowly, uh, I mean, we support them in, in the way how they can find their position within the platform, that's better to say, so that they can then develop their own kind of uh, um, authority and, 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 and uh, uh, quality within the way how they can organize themselves within the platform. So that means that we are working with these knowledge platforms in order to, to not only just share knowledge, but, but to see how the work itself can become far more, hopefully, intelligent and that we don't repeat ourselves over, over the different floors and the different offices we have in, di in different locations. So that we, hopefully with this uh, exchange uh, within the uh, network, uh, the knowledge so that it is uh, better stored, better structured, better exchanged, and better uh, 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 organized in a way how we educate ourselves within the way how we uh, um, uh, process uh, this knowledge. Um, and it has to do with all kinds of forms of uh, 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 participation, of course. Like I talk, uh, said before, that uh, today, when we want to get a form of control, let's call it a, uh, a concept of a, of a control over the process of the design, then, then we have to think of all these levels of participation. And we have to think of new ways of how today the architect can, can get a form of control back into the process. Because, don't forget, Five or even ten years, sorry, ten years ago, but even five years ago, uh, it was so that an, a, a developer might come to me and might say, Ben, you know, you have a, you're a wonderful architect, but we have, uh, you know, we have thought it through. Uh, we, we, know the, we know the organization of the office building we're going to do. We know the cost. Uh, would you like to uh, design the facade for us? So that was often, you know, the type of work we were getting a lot in uh, uh, in, in, let's say, especially in the economical boom time before, uh, uh, the, uh, so the, uh, or in the beginning of two, uh, 2000. But today, what I've learned with a new form of um, knowledge and, and new strategies, the way how we can collaborate, it is far more becomes far more easier to connect this knowledge also to the to uh, to the client, but also to the contractors. It is only so. That you have to learn also, of course, to communicate this knowledge. <coughs> also, if I compare uh, the practice and the pro profession with 10 years ago, then, then what is happening today is that we, we, we have learned that the, uh, the practice is expanding intensely. Like, like if, if we would talk before about aesthetics in architecture and, on the other hand, functionality in architecture, then that phenomenon is, is now totally changing. We don't talk about aesthetics so easily anymore in architecture. We talk about cultural effects. Or when we talk about functionality, then we talk about uh, utility systems. So, so, and of course, uh, these utility systems are becoming more and more complex and diverse. 
as we know today with the regulations around sustainability and, and all the aspects around uh, the engineering of a project, the codes and the, and, and the regulations has become incredible uh, uh, fast and expanded. <coughs> But, but as I said, the cultural side of the profession has been expanded too. And, and as we know, we can refer to fashion, to the, the movie industry, to literature, to, to philosophy. We can, all, we can all work with that now in architecture. We can, we can incorporate it. We can expand on that. Um, but for me, to, to balance this better out, I, I'm, I'm lately also highly fascinated in this aspect of the sciences of architecture. And, and it's an old part of the profession, as we all know. Uh, we know that there was always this interest in science and the way how, for instance, uh, in the technological development of ar architecture, that that, that that could bring the quality and the balance of architecture so well together when you uh, uh, combine it with the cultural effects. And for that reason, I often like to go back to this picture uh, of, of uh, uh, the way how and this is Vienna uh, in the Café Kringenstein, where uh, in, in, uh, in this café Freud with some other scientists would sit together with uh, Klimt, for instance, and, and uh, Kokoschka or, or um, Schiele. Uh, and uh, they, would, they would talk about the latest uh, ideas, the, the latest uh, discoveries. Freud might uh, tell something about his theory, uh, where, uh, uh, for instance, um, um, uh, Klimt might disagree. For instance, I mean, Freud had in that time, of course, his very peculiar ideas about the way how he explained his uh, uh, ideas of, uh, of women. Uh, but but Klimt was was uh, so, I mean, said in in, in 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 the history of his own biography, he was always against it because he said, you know, you, know, you, you are coming up with a theory. We we are drawing women. We we are, we know them sometimes better than than you, you uh, with your abstract uh, theories. Um, um, but that, that describes something of that time and, and the way how scientists and artists would uh, be so close together. But if we think about it today, this local salon or this local uh, uh, dialogue between these different uh, uh, um, um, scientists and, and cultural uh, 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 people <laughs> That is what we can find in the world today as, as well, but of course in a more global salon than the local salon where I, I refer to uh, here. Today we can also get that knowledge, we can set up all these dialogues through another means of uh, media as we know. But, but maybe because of a book I was reading uh, two years ago, you have to read it, it's one of the most fascinating uh, uh, books I've read about a an, an neuroscientist um, uh, uh, the Age of the Insights uh, by Campbell, uh, and, and it's, it's all about this history of the, the period where he was born in Vienna, uh, uh, up to his move uh, here in, uh, to, to New York, and talks about, uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in quite interesting way, differently about the relationship between uh, uh, the philosophy and the psychology of art than, than most of the art historians. And, and one of the things that fascinated me so much in the way how you so well described the large detail of uh, this portrait of um, Egon Schiele, where the social code and the movements of the gesture of the hands are saying something about the character more than maybe the face. <laughs> so so how, how wonderful I thought that such a large detail in, in, in the displacement of the portrait is saying so much about the character. Um, and maybe it had to do with that dialogue uh, of uh, the scientists of that time, uh, but also the way how artists of that time were uh, rethinking uh, painting. Similarly, I think that also always in architecture we have to start always in, 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 in the way how we work again about the way how we formulate and articulate the way how, how ideas come together. And it correlated, that idea of Schiele correlated also with some of the ideas I was working on for a long time uh, myself, like, like what was said about the design model I lately now call the extension of the large detail in architecture uh, to make it a little bit more insightful. 
um, like, like in this ceiling, for instance. This ceiling, uh, what was introduced in the museum uh, as a large detail of the building, uh, in order to guide people from the entrance going up towards the first floor, and when you would come up this first floor, then you would have a reflection of this ceiling uh, 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 as a typological reflection of the landscape outside the building. Uh, this building is uh, designed in the city of Nijmegen. Uh, the, the, the museum is placed against a, a Roman wall. Actually, uh, nobody would believe that they're in Holland, the Roman walls, but they are. The Romans were in Holland. Um, but they, they came only half upway uh, 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 the, 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 the side of Holland. But this reflection of this archaeological uh, 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 view of the landscape um, was introduced also there to introduce a, a reflectiveness between, not only between the landscape and the ceiling, but also between the organization of the museum and, and the uh, exterior as well, because it's an archaeological uh, museum. Um, but if you, if you come into the museum and you see the ceiling, then, then it really literally reflects that kind of quality of the, 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 the movement of the landscape back into the ceiling, there where also more daylight comes into the building. Or as I said, when you come into the building itself and you move up the staircase, what is actually a, another large detail within this project, uh, because it's, it's, it's almost holding up the whole project. It's a very important column, you could argue, what, what, what actually stabilizes the whole building. Uh, but in the same time, the staircase is a staircase within the staircase within the staircase. So, so the staircase guides you towards many different parts of the building whenever you are into the staircase. So it might bring you to the cafe or this part of the staircase is bringing in, uh, brings you to the garderobe. Uh, the beginning of the staircase is connected to the... Um, uh, the ticket uh, office, and of course, this uh, what wider staircase brings you to this uh, 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 gallery like space uh, where all the other uh, exhibition spaces are connected to. So, so this idea of the larger detail, the, the way how it can project a particular kind of uh, principle of how people come together around this larger detail, how it uh, creates a kind of public construct. How, how it reflects, uh, in one way or the other, something of, of that what one can uh, uh, collect uh, from not only from the external forces from the building itself, but also in the internal concept of the building, was for me always very important to bring into that, 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 that idea of the, of the guiding force of the larger detail. Similarly, in this uh, 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 pavilion, we designed for the Millennium Square uh, in uh, Chicago. Um, it was uh, there uh, to celebrate uh, Burnham um, uh, when, when um, the city was allowing uh, Zaha Hadid and myself to do this pavilion for the Millennium Park. Uh, the pavilion, as you maybe can recognize, uh, uh, brings a lot of reminiscences forwards of the history of the city. Uh, I think of the work of uh, Frank Wright, but also Mies, with the floating landscape and, and displacing its, its, its kind of elevated the quality of the floor up to, the, to a higher level. Um, but also plays with the idea of the diagonal um, uh, avenues within the city itself. Because when you come into the pavilion, then with these larger gestures, these larger twisted columns, uh, you, you do get these diagonal views, similarly like in the urban plan, but, it more, but here more in a sectional manner, but in the way how that is uh, introduced in the pavilion. But also to suggest to its maybe an, a strategy of the future of the city, how this could be further expanded to its uh, uh, further ideas uh, for the city. And in the night, like what I said, about the public construct of the uh, 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 staircase of the Falco Museum. This pavilion also creates an incredible, uh, interesting public uh, series of events. Uh, many uh, dance performances were given in this pavilion because it's just open. Uh, everyone can use it. Ma many types of uh, classes were given in this uh, pavilion in the night. And 
as was mentioned in the introduction, the Asmus Bridge for me was having a similar kind of effect for the city of Rotterdam as a larger detail. Um, a detail but but it's not to do nothing to do with the names people gave to the bridge, like like one called it uh, the kneeling person or um, the swan or, or many other names have been given to the bridge. But for me this bridge also always referred to the uh, the cranes in the harbour of Rotterdam, where the robustness and the industrial history of Rotterdam comes much more forward <laughs> into that that maybe bending force of the of the pilot. But it also connects itself from the northern side to the uh, uh, southern side of the river, uh, where um, this this bridge wants to uh, symbolise itself uh, uh, with in order to. To, to make that link towards the south development, this area, uh, what is now almost the fully finished uh, in, in the uh, southern side of Rotterdam. But, but that reflectiveness and that double reading of, of the bridge uh, with its history could not be placed in another location, was my opinion always. You could not uh, think of a bridge like this in, in Amsterdam or in a city, uh, what is a highly administrative city like Den Haag. So, so for me, this bridge needed to have that double reading in its own location with its own strength. Uh, but we, we brought it also forwards in the way how we developed the color of the bridge. So it's a light blue, um, I call it sometimes a joke and I say it's a baby blue color, but it's a, a very light blue color but sometimes with, with uh, different um, uh, uh, light coming onto the pylon, it changes constantly with the landscape and the skies uh, of, of this, uh, of this uh, context of the, of the bridge. And maybe similarly, in many of our late, latest work of, of uh, the years, we have played with this idea of the self-reflectiveness of, of the character of the location. And in, in a way, how through the larger details, these reflections could give a particular kind of uh, interpretation of, of, the, of the owner or uh, the, the site or the city, as I mentioned. Like this house, for instance, is uh, a house uh, what, uh, by, by, uh, by, uh, by um, yeah, but it's actually quite an, uh, a, a pity that we can't really visit the house anymore because it doesn't exist anymore. But what, what was the beauty of the house was that it was uh, uh, playing a lot with this uh, effect of the after image. Uh, so if, if you go into the house or if you are surrounded by the house, you can always read the building as something more than only the building itself. Um, but what maybe is another aspect is that the, art, uh, the owner here uh, is, is Russian. Um, and, and uh, uh, loved gold. I wanted to have that also in one way or the other also be reflected back in, in, in one way or the other in the uh, uh, effect of the house itself as well. But, but the idea of the after image is in many layers to be found in the house. So if you walk around, if you walked around the house, um, this extension of the landscape moved very uh, naturally over into the building itself, so that sometimes you would not even see some of the where the beginning or the end of the landscape appeared. But, but the principle of the after image, for me, was very important to work on in over all these years, because I believe that, that architecture should not generate a one-off image, or a one-off thought, or a one-off effect, but that it would create many layers of readings and that, would, that over the time that if you would have visited a house or a place uh, that you would like to come back to it. Maybe sometimes what we, you know, I don't want to be arrogant there but I would like to be, be modest about it but sometimes it's so nice to, to read a wonderful book and that you would like to reread it again because you discover things within the rereading of, of, the, of this book and similarly we try to introduce that uh, effect here uh, similarly. Another idea, uh, what already in the <coughs> earlier work in the Möbius house similarly appeared, was this idea of the dual qualities, not only of the reading, but also of the materials we introduced, like, like I referred to in the material of the house and the materials used in the house, 
here in, in the in the uh, sorry in the in the Möbius house, the idea of the glass facade and the concrete used on the outside was always turning in and out within the way how uh, you uh, move uh, around the house and in the house. Like for instance, the glass <coughs> facade moves from the outside towards the inside here and makes a, a break between the living room area and the sleeping room uh, areas upstairs. And, and the reason why the client asked me to, to make that break is because they hoped always whenever they would be, the owners would be home and the, and, and the children who were by the time when the house was built were around 18, 70 years old, they said, yeah, we would really love to see them coming home. They don't have to talk to us, they don't have to say goodbye when they go to bed, but I mean, we just like to see them coming home. Um, so the, the division between the semi-private, the semi-public was constantly being triggered within the communication within the way how the house is organized. And I will later talk a little bit more about the way how the Möbius structure literally from, from its organization, from the living and the working and the sleeping as a continuous movement was introduced in the house as, as a for, very important tool for the design of the beginning of this uh, house. So material dualities, as I said, further expanded them in the work, uh, became a particular strategy for, for how we sometimes had to deal with closed facades, for instance, like in this laboratorium building in Groningen, where the green uh, texture uh, communicates only there with the green of the landscape in the in the period uh, between, of course, the spring and and late summer, um, but then you would only understand it. You would maybe not understand so much what this green reference means when you don't see this green on. So so the play between open and closed strategies, between the way how the daylight could come into the building in this same laboratorium, was only introduced there where people would meet, for instance. So where where a particular kind of form of social sustainable qualities came into the, uh, here in the design, where people would exchange then their ideas about the, the knowledge developed in the laboratoriums and, and would expand on the knowledge <laughs> during the walk uh, while they were on, uh, walking on this staircase. And that's what we lately now do more and more. We, we hide the elevators. We make sure that people walk a lot in buildings and, and would meet each other much more than ever before, because because we know how important it is to, like in a university like uh, like uh, like this, as we know, it's more important to meet the un uh, to, to the professors, the visitors, on the stair whenever you 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 can, instead of uh, hiding yourself in an elevator. Um, and maybe in the latest house uh, here, in the, in the intertwining of a wooden element. The house is not fully finished, but, but will be done in a few months' time. Uh, uh, we play with almost similarly like the two hands of uh, Shida, whereby the crossing of the, of the beams gives a suggestion of its secret behind it, but we don't know what is exactly behind it. But, but one of the most fascinating aspects in architecture, I've always believed, are the things who are not fully there yet, like like the void space, or maybe we could call architecture in a, in a general manner the void space, because we often have to frame it, we have to uh, give it a direction, to have it to give it an organization or a material materialization, like uh, in this case the void space of the Mercedes Benz Museum. Whenever you um, come into this void space, it's never clear if if you are driving or the car is driving because the car is constantly moving around you and, and hangs on the walls like as if you come out of a kaleidoscopic dream. So the whole building is pl placed uh, within this strategy of that the classical modernistic space uh, is not anymore in front of you. Uh, this idea of the, 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 the eye and the camera idea is here not fully anymore to be uh, experienced. Uh, it is here so that it is almost like if the spaces are following you and are underneath you and are above you, as if it is a kaleidoscopic space. And, and the reason is because of this void. The void gives you constantly new readings uh, because the, 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 the movement in the way how you move down within this museum, you, you start at the top, you move down very slowly, 
and then there is a second spiral, so there are two spirals crossing down. <coughs> Give you the feeling that you don't know if you've been already in one place or the other. So you constantly have the idea that you um, have to take another route. But you, you, are, you are on the right route because you can always cross over uh, from one uh, route to the other route in the building. But the texture of the void is the most important. So if you look up, you don't know what, what, what the absence of, of this void is, because you don't know fully what, 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 what is displayed in the building. Uh, but if you then go up the elevators, then you slowly discover the, the diversity of this texture of the void. Uh, as you can see here, then the sec so the main light comes through the walls from above, but the secondary daylight comes in through the twist within the building. And these twist elements, they, they are, again, a larger detail who carry the, the platforms of the exhibition spaces. And they then, as here, um, maybe clearly is also to be seen, they guide the light, they guide you through the way how you move through the building. And they are the construction of the building, of course, as well. And you can see here that the best, so it's a <coughs> quite an... Um, a quite a complex uh, uh, section uh, and a texture. If, if, so it's an unfolded section of the building. So if you, if you move from this top and, and you go down, then that is one route. And that is picked up on this side here again, etc. But the second route is this route, but, but steps down. But as you can see, you can always cross over from one system to the next. So, so the texture and the diversity of the organization of the building gives in a lot of different <laughs> readings and a lot of diversity in the way how one can uh, experience this interior of the building. But, but the interior is also exported towards the exterior, so it's almost like if, if it is projected towards the outside. Uh, the internal organization is, is uh, progressed and, and projected towards a similar kind of effect as you can see on the outside, where where it gave an incredible unexpected uh, qualities. Like, like the diagonal windows, they give a direct view to it's the highway around the building. And it's almost like if you're walking around the building, uh, as if the cars can drive into the building. And of course, I mean, uh, making a void like that generated uh, a lot of model making and, and I wanted to make sure that this model could uh, 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 give all the effects and the readings and the qualities we were after in order to, uh, um, to, to gain in this project. One last idea I want to explain, I forgot to explain it, but that, that all this concrete, you might say, uh, is, is, is quite unusual for a uh, car museum. And, and similarly, the client was, was quite unusually unhappy in the beginning about the concrete. They said, why so much concrete? Uh, because I, I said to them, if you're not happy, during the process of the, the design, uh, before we build the project, we can always paint it, I said, if, if we could make it lighter. But when the, cake, the concrete came out, um, we all liked it so much. The only thing is that the client didn't like it so much. They thought it was too rough. Um, and it was very hard to convince the client. But whenever uh, we brought in slowly the, the cars, they became more fascinated. and, and uh, 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 liked also the shininess of the cars and, and the colors of the cars in the relationship to the, the roughness of the concrete. But my argument always with this, in this building, and, and as I explained in the beginning, the crossing of programmatic entities we introduced uh, in, in so many of our work was introduced here similarly. This building refers more to the tunnels and, and the concrete bridges in the context of Stuttgart than, than let's say, the concrete of concrete uh, buildings. Um, so, so it's a highly infrastructural building. And that also when, when, when we explain all that to the client and we refer to all the engineers, the wonderful engineers you can find in the city of Stuttgart, like uh, maybe I don't know, you know the work of Sleich, Leonard, I mean now lately of course we have the work of uh, Werner Sobeck, but, but um, that, that history is to be found in the context of uh, Stuttgart. So if you think there is a lo lot of um, uh, introversion maybe going on in the building, there is a lot of uh, extension 
and also a lot of context to be found within the way how we place this building on its side. Like, like if you come into Stuttgart, you, you drive from the hills down into the, uh, um, into the bowl of the city. Uh, and similarly, like uh, this kind of stepping from the top down into this museum slowly to its uh, lower part is reflecting that context of uh, Stuttgart. So you might think, I mean, this facade has nothing to do with the context, but it's reflecting a lot of the context of uh, Stuttgart. Um, so, so talking about the void space, uh, similarly lately, uh, within the cities we are working with, we, we play with that idea uh, quite a lot uh, in order to extend and expand on the principle of the void space, like, like this project we did for the city of Singapore, whereby we constantly tested whenever you would be higher in this residential project that you would have a different type of view than whenever you would be lower in the building. And the project is uh, placed in an, in an environment where you can imagine that uh, uh, Singapore is in, in, in a city that is full of its, uh, is full of control of, of its own kind of qualities. Um, like there is, we know that maybe so much landscape to be found in Singapore. Whenever you drive into Singapore, it's almost like if you enter a, 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 a landscape city, uh, it's full of flowers and full of green. And that idea of the green, the gr green quality of the landscape, we wanted to bring into this residential project, whereby the first floors are totally opened up because it's a small t and tidy site. And, and uh, similarly up into the higher part of the building where all the windows are connected to each other, this organic uh, principle of the landscape and, 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 and its play with the landscape is uh, to be found back in that as well. You can see the, 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 the ground floor area where of course we have to deal with all the areas around the entrance of the parking and all the amenities around the side for this project uh, similarly. And the articulation of the windows and the different types of windows with different types of lamellas and sometimes a double height balcony was introduced also to bring all the wind into the apartments. As so much uh, uh, sustainability uh, is required in the city of Singapore. So the landscape needs to be brought into the building but also ideas around uh, uh, environmental qualities as well. You can maybe see here that here the best, uh, the, the one apartment is having a double height balcony so that uh, the wind can collect itself, especially uh, not during the day so much, but especially after six or seven o'clock, whereby then it can cool down uh, the apartment in the evening. You see it maybe a bit much better. So it's a, it, it, it's a similar kind of cross or complex section we know so well from the way how we can play with, with a double height uh, flooring system in, in, an, in an apartment, but here it's not done in the cross section, but in the longitudinal uh, section of the apartment. You can, you can see that here the best how these different floors are also intertwined in many different angles when you look up into the building, and when it almost closes it itself down when you look at the top of the project. The double height balconies and, and the Lamella structures are there, of course, not only to, to bring the wind in, but also to protect the heat uh, coming into the apartments. For that reason, the depth of the, these lamellas. <coughs> and playing again with the texture of, of a void space within the city, as, as we can argue uh, for, or we, we argued for. Uh, because we, we picked up so many ideas of, of principal elements you can find so much in the context of the city whereby we, in a way, transformed it into the ideas of this uh, project. Uh, the apartments are, are so organized that they, as I said, they sometimes uh, have this double height uh, balcony, but they have also, on two sides, only two columns, whereby we could, in the front area, so where the living room area is, or the, the, the major important view towards the context, there are no columns. So we could bring all the forces to the edge of the building on this side of the project. So we have here no columns. 
and, and uh, of course all the service areas with the sleeping rooms are to be brought more to the uh, end of uh, uh, the, the, the apartment uh, uh, building and mirrored on the other side when you are uh, uh, having the apartment on the other side of the building. So you can see that if you come uh, from the central core area into the apartment then you can circulate the house from this area and here we can see the uh, quite wide and open column-free space within the uh, living room uh, area. And in the corners we try to avoid also uh, any profile to be introduced so whenever you would walk around the apartment that you would always have it, its full view. But through the whole development of the project we had little time. The, the, the development of new techniques and, and uh, the discipline uh, uh, way of how we could build this project in a quite precise and a quite uh, advanced and quick manner was to introduce all these different uh, 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 elements. There are only 17 elements, but they're constantly mirrored and, and uh, uh, turned in upside down in a way whereby we could, with uh, these simple elements, uh, could uh, uh, develop a quite complex uh, facade. But, but these ideas are not only used for, for let's say, high-end uh, uh, housing or international housing projects. We do so much right now. We also apply that to, towards the affordable housing projects we do, for instance, in this case, Korea. Uh, sometimes the housing projects, they, they're so equal in its organization and equal in its appearance that we, for this project, made sure that, that every street and path uh, would have get its own identity with its own tree so that people would recognize where they walk, walk in the urban plan but also that each building would uh, create with only a few elements, maybe six elements in this case for this building, uh, we could create a lot of diversity in the urban plan of this project. So, so whenever these, we design these ideas of living, working and sleeping, because that was also a part of the, the task in the uh, apartment building in uh, Singapore, then we still base that on the diagram or the principle of this uh, maybe design model of, of, of the Moses house. So where living and sleeping and working were all to be combined in these four quadrants of the landscape of the Moses house. And that was for that time quite new because in, 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 in uh, let's say, so the mid-90s, uh, nobody was talking yet about working at home. But this client was convinced that, that he and she would almost uh, for at least six hours uh, work also at home. And, and actually only after a few years they worked for full time from home. He was uh, setting up a magazine and did a whole magazine uh, project from, from home and she did uh, her own uh, work uh, from home uh, at least uh, six to seven hours a day. That's why they wanted to live apart uh, from each other and work apart and at the same time share, of course, all these spaces. They wanted to share uh, within the organization of this continuous uh, loop of living, working and sleeping. And, and, and these ideas have been further expanded. For instance, as I explained in the Mercedes-Benz Museum, whereby this idea of the continuous loop um, uh, plays with, with the principle of that uh, while you walk around in this building, uh, you, you, it's almost like that you are driving and the car uh, stands still. Or in other latest pavilion projects, whereby the continuousness <laughs> is introduced in many different ways. Or in material effects. Or in this case of an, uh, uh, an apartment, of an art collector in uh, New York, uh, where uh, the uh, collector with a fantastic loft uh, of, of all his paintings wanted to, wanted to live there, but also live with his collection. Only we opened up all his windows uh, in order to make sure that he would have also a dynamic uh, artwork with a view towards the context uh, of the city. And sometimes we also design uh, bags for uh, dogs. You know. 
So you see the apartment here, uh, uh, quite, quite open, quite light, with, with, an, with an light ceiling, what, what suggests a bit more height within the central space, because uh, the loft is, is, is quite uh, uh, low in its uh, uh, organization, uh, but it creates an incredible nice depth within the organization of the, the apartment. And the, these rails are all to be, or were all to be introduced for bringing onto these rails uh, the uh, a flexible lighting uh, system in order to light all the artwork. And, and the, the chairs and the carpets, uh, where, where the furniture are placed on, where, where this um, um, protector uh, lives with, can be moved to different parts of the apartment so that he can have an evening with his friends and, and, and sit next to a solo wit and can have the conversation about his friends about this solo wit. And, and uh, so with that create, uh, with that a very highly flexible uh, a, a place. And you see him working here as well. And sometimes do get a, a nice comment about uh, Ben, sometimes I don't know if I need to make up my bed or not. Because if I make up my bed, then, 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 then I'm living too much in a gallery. And if I, if I uh, not make up my bed, then it's becoming my home. But, but he says that he always likes that of the place, that, that it is sometimes so uh, easy for him to read this place in, in these different manners and these different using uh, qualities uh, he, he in, or we introduced together in this house. So, so this idea of, of how a surface might turn into a dynamic surface uh, came out of the ideas of not only uh, mathematical ideas, um, like the Möbius structure or the trifold organization or this is a Klein bottle, but they came also out of the idea that the grid model as a geometrical model was not anymore giving us the full efficiency as a strategy how to organize uh, all the architectural ingredients around it, uh, like the trifold organization in the Mercedes-Benz Museum we discovered, gave us so much more capacity in the way how it can carry construction, infrastructure, programmatic distribution, how it can play with a lot of engineering qualities and gave us a total new uh, efficiency model than we ever uh, thought about uh, before when we worked with uh, 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 orthogonal equal potential uh, systems. And, and, and this idea of the manipulation of the, of, the, of the surface whereby, you know, the idea of the black hole in the face and the white wall of the surface of the face, as we used it in architecture before as a masquerade, has been in our work constantly be twist, twisted and tested over many different directions and, and, and pulled in many uh, uh, different uh, forms over the work. Like, like in this case, in another void of a uh, project we did in uh, Korea, whereby here you don't know if this building is 20 or 30 floors or 60 floors up high. And, and whereby in, in a department store like this, we played with the idea if, of if it is a museum or either a department store. And maybe we flirted here with, with some of Andy Warhol's uh, uh, sayings like, like Andy Warhol who was so fascinated in, in, in the department store and believed so much that when we all would die, uh, he argued uh, we would all end up in uh, Bloomingdale's, you know, so, so this kind of, kind of funny belief that, 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 um, that uh, um, the made in heaven effect is to be found in a department store is something we really convinced the client with, uh, to play with because, because why not? Uh, uh, placing all the products in, in, in a place like this where the product becomes almost there to be experienced as an artwork. And why not, like we know in Asia where uh, department stores are, are in a way the most important public spaces, why would it not be interesting to make uh, a catwalk for the people who walk around in, in a half museum like this um, so that they can be also be seen, that they can be recognized. And that double reading of the interior and the different qualities of the, the programmatic double reading and the, and the double reading of the void space uh, related to the facade is similarly to be found in this case here as well. Whereby, 
waarbij in een, uh, uh, um, in een uh, moree effect, it, it's almost so that it looks like if this facade is having een an, uh, an, an plastiek uh, uh, or a debt, uh, what is not really there. But, but the idea of the, the way of how one can work with these parallax experiences, like in this house, where the landscape is turned inside out into the house, or if you have walked around the house and you come into the house, it's almost that you feel the echo of the context of the landscape in the house. So this parallax experience, this parallax view of the way how we can design today uh, brings us often to its ideas like these, whereby sometimes you don't know if you are really into the landscape of, of the context of the house or the house is the landscape. But let me go back to that what I promised. You know, maybe I'm talking too much about the, um, the cultural effects now of architecture and not about the, 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 what I promised, the te technological innovation behind it. Because without some of the inventions, certain things are not possible. Like the Mercedes-Benz uh, Museum is having in its central fort a smoke detector system that was not invented by me but what was invented by many uh, specialists. And the specialists, um, they gave the, together the idea that if there would be a fire, that the smoke would be uh, sucked out of the building almost in uh, four to uh, five minutes. And you can see here that all the people from the city department standing there who, was, who were for two years not in belief that this was possible. And, and, and we for a long time had an uh, alternative plan for the building whereby we had to close down all the compartments in the building with, with glass and other materials so that, so that we could not make this open building. But when this experiment in the beginning was tested out, uh, after two or three tests everyone was agreeing with, within the city that we could break somewhere here the rules. And, and that's why I'm talking about when it comes down to new innovations that the invisible often is more important that, that what you, than that what you see. And with this we could uh, reduce down close to 15% uh, of the building cost, but also f uh, close to 20% of the uh, material cost. So we could reduce down a lot of materials within the way how we didn't have to compartmentalize the building. And, and maybe similarly, uh, we wanted that open space because we wanted to see the cars, like, like what I said about the, the, maybe the, the experience of a contemporary museum, like, like the MoMA, where you come up the staircase and you look into this atrium and you see this helicopter hanging. Uh, what is it that, that we think about it, uh, an industrial product like this? I mean, we, we conceive it as artwork. Why could not be the car to be seen as an artwork? And, and I tried really very hard to convince the client that they should not make a design for a salon only or a place where only one car is presented for the brand alone, but that the wider public could come in and experience the whole making of, of the history of the car. And where all the kind of aspects of the pub public construct and the public meeting spaces could be uh, generating a lot of uh, interactiveness and, and where people could stay within the building. Uh, another aspect uh, of, of a latest innovation that we uh, use now in all our buildings is the concrete core activation whereby um, you can heat up the concrete for three hours in the morning in this building or, or cool it and then it stays for the whole day warm or cool. And, and this idea, of course, is already used in, 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 in uh, many places now in the world. But, but I find it the most interesting to reduce with that an enormous amount of energy in the buildings we do. Or new techniques, where I talked about. Today, with new techniques, we can be so fast. We can now, up to a 3D model, exchange maybe 400 changes within the building of the 3D model to all the contractors we work with. So we, that was not possible even not seven years ago. Um, but when we did this project uh, in 2006, we had not Grasshopper yet. So we developed our own kind of uh, new forms of uh, 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 digital programs to readjust and, 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 and animate our changes. 
And, and again, this idea of disciplining a building, like with larger details, like with these twists, was the only way how to do the project, because we had only one and a half year to build this project again. The client wanted to compete with BMW, um, who were also doing a similar building, and it had to be finished for the World Soccer Game in 2006. So we had to find a strategy to, to come up with an idea with such, again, quite complex project to make it buildable. And we came up with this idea of these twists who are holding up all the elements of the building. So, so they're, in a way, the horizontal columns of the structure who carry these different uh, platforms within the organization of the building. And as you can see here, they, they also make, in a way, so much of the spaces and melt the whole project together in the way how you can double read them in many aspects of how they come together. They became a kind of me mechanical object uh, uh, within the building in the way how uh, they uh, uh, were pulled together as some of the columns and how we brought in also the glass within the organization of the project. So, but, but the most important, what I like to uh, uh, say at this end of the talk, is that, that if we talk about closed innovation and collaborative modes of, of, of uh, a phase where collaboration, of course, is not new, but where we change the scale and the tools of collaboration, then it's become so important to join uh, new ideas of the way how we exchange knowledge. And within this idea of exchanging knowledge, I do believe that it is not so important anymore to think of this idea of close innovation anymore. I, I'm, I'm literally uh, now very open to uh, sharing most of the knowledge and even with, with this contemporary knowledge, what is actually almost uh, for a few years uh, uh, now uh, active within the studio, I'm, I'm constantly testing the ideas, uh, talking about it and share it with others in order to make open innovation also in architecture possible because I do believe that we as architects have a public responsibility. If I think about the budgets where I deal with in the city of Amsterdam, then maybe my budget is higher than the local politicians work with, whereas the politicians may need to talk to the public maybe four or five times a day. Architects uh, often uh, stand away a bit, often, uh, a bit for, from that kind of exposure. But I do believe that, that uh, in order to, to be open, uh, one needs to be also uh, attract others to share with you the knowledge in order to improve intelligent architecture, hopefully. Thank you very much. Thank you.